Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of our Seven Investing podcast. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson. There is a lot going on these days in the semiconductor industry, and I brought in an expert on this space to give some viewpoints on what's really going on. Robert Quinn is a semiconductor industry content provider, uh, very actively involved on LinkedIn, and he joins me from Texas. Hey, Robert, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? And thanks for being on our Seven Investing podcast. Good, Simon. How you been doing? It's I'm been great. It's been an eventful, super busy, a uh, little bit crazy uh, industry is is just exploding at all seams. It's it's been it's been fun fun to watch. It sure is. This is kind of where all the action's taking place. Maybe we start here at home uh, with Intel, kind of giving some news that it just won a big new contract with the Department of Defense. In fact, Intel's committed a lot of capital to vamping up its uh, its U.S. based capacity. Robert, any thoughts on what Intel's doing here? Is, is there specific customers they're looking at or why is Intel pledging tens of billions of dollars to expand its fabs in Arizona and elsewhere? Well, they've obviously gotten the, the new uh, government uh, contract that they've been working on getting for quite a while. And uh, that's, uh, that's a big deal to them because they do plan on expanding uh, their fabs uh, in Arizona. They've also looked into uh, doing other things. So there's rumors around the world saying that uh, Intel would like to possibly buy some other companies like Global Foundries or something like that. Um, you know, currently already existing fabs. Um, I, I've heard that about uh, people looking at uh, other companies like Texas Instruments to Global Foundries and uh, looking, looking at mergers there. But uh, yeah, Intel is definitely expanding. They are um, wanting to get into the new EUV. Um, EUV is the next, the next section of bringing the, it brings chips from seven nanometers to below. And, uh, and they're definitely wanting to start a whole, doing a whole lot more of that here in the United States. And let's talk about that a little bit, because that's actually an important deal, right? Seven nanometers and below. We've seen Intel kind of struggle with process technologies in the last couple of years, but it seems like they're revamping those efforts. Of course, smaller nanometer nodes uh, means higher performance chips. Is, is Intel using this for its own internal processors, or is it looking to go out and get its foundry division more involved in making chips for other people? Well, from the looks of what they're wanting to do with the DOD, uh, that tells me right there that they're wanting to expand the foundry for sure. Um, the foundry chips that they're also looking at, um, the, the foundry chips that they've contracted with the DOD, uh, I believe wouldn't involve EUV. Um, but the, uh, they are looking to expand that with, for their own products and uh, other foundry products in the future. Um, they've, they have tried, they have failed. Um, in the past, and they've they've had some uh, issues trying to bring that uh, the te technology to the to the next level um, here in the United States. And they are currently outsourcing a lot of that to TSMC in Taiwan, and so uh, that's a it was a it was sad to see uh, Intel not be able to keep up with that race. But uh, I think they will um, come back around, and they will. Uh, get into the EUV and they will start developing more chips in the future um, on, on, on that side, but it just may take some time. So, and, and on that note, I know that you have a background, you know, with a lot of the capital equipment that goes into semiconductor manufacturing. Um, this isn't something that, that happens immediately, right? We're in the middle of kind of this, this ship crunch globally. There's a supply shortage of semiconductors, but it's not so easy. It's just flipping a switch and all of a sudden that goes away. Right. 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 I mean, the, the, Chip shortage, I'm afraid, I, I'm afraid that it's here to stay for a while. Um, the purchasing, to be able to purchase the equipment that um, is, it, it takes to make these computer chips between, from the, from the ordering process to the install process and um, actually running production, full production, you're looking at a year process. And so it, it does take a while um, to build these fabs and to bring these tools in and to actually get them running to production. Um, one of the, when Samsung went down, they lost power. Um, the hardest part was getting the tools running again to run full production because it's not something like just flipping a switch. You just don't flip a switch for these machines. Uh, they take a long time to actually um, purge out all the particles and, and to uh, start making processes, to running the process at, at a, capacity to where they're um, 
they're, they're at full production. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You had mentioned uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, of course, the largest manufacturer for at least for foundry of, of making other people's chips. Um, speaking of a shortage, Taiwan Semi just announced that they're going to be increasing prices up to 20% uh, for a lot of the contracts that they have for production out there. How is this going to impact, you know, smartphones and consumer electronics? Are we going to see prices increasing just because um, there's so much demand for chips that the prices of those are going to be going up? I think it does. I think it, I think it has to be passed to the consumer um, eventually. And it's just now starting uh, with TSMC uh, saying that they're going to raise their prices. I believe that that happens to other companies as well. Uh, they, they all raise their prices and that eventually gets passed down to the consumer. Um, but there's, there's other things such as how that affects other markets as well. I, I'm kind of following a little bit of the crypto market and I, I also see what happens. Uh, I, I see that possibly affecting the crypto market as well in the long run. So, yeah. Can you double click on that one, Robert? What would be the impact of uh, fewer chips available out there to cryptocurrency pricing? Well, there's currently a, a big shortage of chips. And if we're not getting more, uh, more chips, that means less miners. Uh, people mine, people with, with less chips and less, uh, with the increase of prices, they could be possibly less miners, people mining the, mining the, the cryptocurrency. And, uh, and then that could eventually turn into uh, definitely a, 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 an a increase in crypto prices, I think. But we'll see. <laughs> you know, men mentioning the miners, it's really interesting, too, because uh, you, you said, I believe it was UV earlier, right? Sub, sub, sub seven nanometer nodes. Any, easy for anyone else to say who's had more coffee than I have this afternoon. But <laughs> there's geopolitical risks in this as well, too, right? And especially with China. Um, China recognizes Taiwan as part of China. Uh, the rest of the world kind of recognizes it a, as an independent democracy. But Taiwan is making uh, so many of the world's chips right now, and it's getting smaller and smaller nodes. How do you see China impacting all of this? I know that China is really, really interested in uh, having its own domestic supply of semiconductor chips, but that's kind of challenging as process technologies continue to evolve out there. Definitely. Um, China is is working on trying to, uh, they, they've, they've talked about, you know, expanding their semiconductor market and, um, and, and growing. Uh, they want to, they definitely want to dominate the semiconductor market. United States is pushing back on that um, by not allowing them to have uh, certain equipment, such as the EUV tools that we spoke of. Um, and uh, because there are American patents within those machines, uh, we're restricting them from getting uh, those, that EUV equipment and expand, allowing them to expand their EUV production. Um, so, but Taiwan is, uh, there's a lot of eggs in one basket with, uh, with Taiwan right now uh, from the United States. There's uh, every company from Intel, Tesla, Apple, um, all these companies are producing ships uh, at TSMC Taiwan. And so there's uh, a lot going on there. And is, as you may, I, I just recently read that we have three, three fleet carriers off the coast of Okinawa um, and that there's a lot of military action going on out there in the China Sea. And so there's, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And uh, we're sure hoping that, that nothing happens, but, uh, it's, it is a, a risk right now, I think. You mentioned a company uh, when we were chatting right before the interview, ASML, and they play an important role in this as well. Uh, what, what is that company to and how does that impact uh, the development of faster chips? ASML produces a tool called EUV. EUV brings uh, the semiconductor chips from the seven nanometer down to the, uh, the smaller nodes, um, down to, I believe, one nanometer it is. Uh, but they... Um, they, th this tool is a hundred, I believe it was $120 million for one machine. They're, they're, Don't drop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, they're very expensive and, uh, and they do take a long time to build. They, they are, a, uh, I believe I, I read that they were a one year um, to build one of these machines as well. Um, but they are a, a big player in the market and they are, a, a big player and and being able to 
uh, continue our, our semiconductor growth worldwide. Uh, and so, and, and producing these, these next level chips that will be able that everybody's wanting in, in their phones and, and in all the computing that's going to be going on in the future. So. And, and some of those like, like smartphones have, have demands for very small chips, right? Even Tesla, you know, Elon Musk is wanting to have very, very specific high performance chips. They're going to require those best in class that, you know, that, uh, Taiwan Semiconductors is glad to provide these higher prices, but because yeah. of kind of those supply tensions and everything else we've talked about with China, do you see China taking a lot of the supply for things that don't need to be less than seven nanometers? I mean, are they going to be going after the, the uh, less expensive chips that are used for everything else out there? There's going to be continue to be a big demand for all these other, other chips that are, you know, 14 nanometers and above. And that's where that's where China is really aiming right now to to uh, to build those chips, and uh, it's probably part of their Belt and Belt. And, what is it called? The Belt and Road Initiative, I believe it is. Um, but they um, they want to continue to to build those chips for the world, and um, and then there's the rest. You know, TSM, TSMC's and the Intel's and the Samsung's that want to move into uh, doing more with the seven nanometer and blow and using the EUV equipment. So it's um, it, China's. It, it'll be interesting to see how China continues to grow in that market and how we may put restrictions on them uh, to to grow in that market. We we really um, hindered their five G development um, around the world by uh, sanctioning uh, a lot of their 5G. So um, it'll be interesting to see if the United States continues to uh, put sanctions on China with, um, with other developments. Uh, and uh, 5G was not the, you know, it was not the super small nodes, but it was something that the United States didn't want them to uh, be producing. So that there was a lot of sanctions on, on 5G and we um, were fairly successful at, at uh, at hindering that and for for China, but um, they'll they'll continue to make a lot of the other um, chips and and they they do it successfully. So there's a lot of other countries that are 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 in are in contracts with with China and and willing to buy a lot of chips from them, as we are too in the United States. So you know even the United States is willing to buy chips from China, but um, but we. We, we are just trying to limit on what, what they can produce, so. Absolutely, so okay, so we've got some supply constraints right now. We've got some geopolitical tensions right now. It's gonna take some time for this capacity to, to take shape anyway, but are, do you believe that there's enough capacity going in place, right, between Taiwan semi added capacity, with Intel bringing its foundries on, on board in Arizona, uh, we've seen even Samsung is, is pledging in global foundries and every other chip maker out there seems like they're investing at this part of the cycle. Uh, my, my question is actually about the Internet of Things, because we've, we've heard Cisco touting for years that they want to add 10 billion more Internet of Things devices in the next several years. Are we going to have enough capacity even after these expansions to keep up? Or is the world just perpetually now in this world of an insatiable thirst for more and more chips every year? I, I believe that the chip, uh, the need for chip continues. Uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't get, um, uh, it, it, we continue to need the chips and we will, it will grow. Um, I, I think we will, I was talking to somebody the other day about how I, I see the chip fabs Produce, being up and running in the next three years, these ones that they're wanting in the United States anyways, um, they, they will be up and running in the next three to four years. And um, I, I continually get asked, are we going to overproduce chips in the United States? And I think between the delays, we will probably see the natural occurring delays and, and the probably a backup of equipment um, because this is, there's so much equipment that will need to be ordered um, and, and produced. Um, and I just don't see how these uh, OEMs will be able to produce that much equipment um, that quickly. But um, there will probably be a backlog of equipment anyways. And, um, and, and I could see how this will maybe turn that three years into, you know, four years, maybe five years of, of, you know, getting these chip fabs online and producing chips. Um, 
I see us in 10 years saying, hey, we need to order more chips and we need to, we need to build more chip fabs again, you know, in, in 10 years from now, we're, we're going to say, hey, we need to, because the um, growth of chip demand just keeps growing and, uh, and it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have a real, doesn't really level off anywhere. It continues to grow, but um, I don't foresee us overproducing chips. Um, in, in, the, in the near future, because I, with the with the growth of, of shift demand, it, it will continue to to go inside and in, in tune with each other. So, and, and, and to top it all off, these fabs who are you know a uh, hundred billion dollar facilities, they're they're not going to produce these fabs unless they know they can make money. And uh, they're, they, they know that there's a demand there. They know this exponential growth of chip demand. And uh, they're just not going to invest this money without having that demand in place. So, yeah. Uh, companies like Samsung, they work very frugally. And, and they're super, super efficient. And um, it, the fact that we're seeing Samsung saying that they want to invest and build fabs in the United States tells me that that market is going to continue to, to grow. And because of the frugality, I've, I, kn I worked at Samsung and I'm familiar with them and because of their frugality and I know how they operate that, uh, that yes, we, we will continue to see that demand. They're not going to put money to work until they're absolutely sure that there's demand that's going to back it up. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let, let me take a step back and ask about design a little bit. It's kind of, we shift gears to a different subject. You know, we, we've seen CPUs kind of dominate for several decades but then in recent years, you know, you see NVIDIA go out there and kind of apply GPUs uh, with parallel processing to the data center. It's more efficiently processing for more specialized tasks. And now we're starting to see more and more exotic, you know, TPUs uh, out there or whatever X or Z or YPU. Uh, everyone's got their own flavor of the processing that they want to do as the workloads are getting harder and harder. But Robert, we're also seeing some even, even on top of that, it seems like there's no limit to the design that you can have for a processor. We've heard of quantum computing kind of taking the scene now. We saw AMD uh, acquire Xilinx, you know, which is very highly customizable out there. Heterogeneous computing is kind of a new topic that's being talked about. And one that I'm less familiar with is, is the RISC-V open source uh, instructions for chips that anybody could kind of plug into. Um, I threw a whole lot of terms and ideas out there, but just kind of to step back and broadly pick your brain about this, mm. how do you see design evolving? And are there any technologies that you're kind of betting are going to be a big deal in the coming years? I'm, I'm definitely more focused on the equipment and the fab side, but um, I do keep up with a little bit of, of the design side. And it is uh, pretty neat to, to keep up with because it is... Uh, growing a lot. Obviously, you have quantum computing that's coming up, uh, coming up, and and going to be a huge marketplace in the future. Um, it, it's it's still growing, but um, there's other things such as I believe it is called FPGA. It's a uh, chip that actually software makes the hardware, right? And so you you have an an open source type of chip to where you upload software and the software actually makes the hardware do what it needs to do. Um, and this is, this is really interesting technology in the sense of security um, because not only is your hardware not, um, you, you, you could, the, the hardware is absolutely useless unless you have the software to make the hardware work, right? And so this is a nice security feature in that sense um, that you can um, basically you know, produce a chip that that's not going to be operational operational without that software. Um, and then also there there's you know technologies you know to think that you could shoot a rocket into the rocket into space and and change the hardware on the on the on the rocket just by uploading a soft a new software package to it. Um, it it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something that's interesting in, in that fact, but, um, quantum computing is definitely coming. There are new other technologies that are coming, um, that I'm not very familiar with, um, something about 
uh, photon. I, I'm not going to get into it because uh, it's it's something I'm not familiar with at all. But I, it is a, a new technology I keep hearing about, um, and um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting to see how that that technology is continuing to grow. Yeah, and okay, so we've talked about. Um downstream manufacturing we've talked about design and how that influences too let's go let's go farther upstream now robert and talk about wafer fabrication equipment right the, the guys that are making the tools and the cat and the capital equipment that goes into making the silicon chips for all of these guys downstream of that uh, wh what do you think about the applied materials and the land researches of the world i mean is this demand doesn't matter what kind of chip you're making what kind of memory chip or what kind of processor you're making it seems like they're in a great position to benefit no matter what it looks like right Yes, yeah, so I was looking actually at Applied Materials today. They have over 2,000 positions open right now. <laughs> wow. They are in a mass hiring uh, phase to try to keep up with all this. Um, it, it's, um, they, they, a lot of this new equipment will, it will also be based on Epi, um, which is um, Epi will, will help us develop that three-dimensional processor. Um, and it's uh, that that is something that maybe a tool that not so many fabs currently use, um, that especially the older 200 millimeter fabs. But um, with the new technology and the way that they're developing the chips, um, that changes the equipment sets that they will have to have in the fabs to be able to keep up with the the new chips that they want to make. So um, changing a you know just bringing the nodes down, bringing the gate size down um, is one thing, but also uh, how the chips are made uh, three-dimensionally. Epi actually grows silicon. Um, and then there's other, um, there's other equipment as well. We're going in, we're using a lot of um, tool, we're, we're fixing to go into a new market of silicon nitride and silicon nitride will be the new power chips. And instead of using silicon, they're going to use a silicon nitride or silicon um, SI or SIN. It's a, it's a, the, the silicon nitride. It will help um, with the power producing chips. Hmm. So anything that anything that has power, um, they'll be very. Uh, you'll, you'll start seeing a lot more silicon nitride uh, being used for for power producing chips. Um, I read today that um, on semiconductor is going to be getting in, in more into this, and um, uh, and there's there's a couple of the companies that are getting into it as well. So that's that's a new market that's coming up. It's really big. Yeah, and Robert, I know that you are a uh, kind of an expert in the semiconductor industry. You publish a lot of content to LinkedIn. Um, as my final questions, uh, first of all, where can we go to, to follow you if we want to learn more about semiconductor industry? And then coupled with that is maybe just what's one or two things in the industry that you're kind of excited about that you're following right now? Right. Um, well, if you want to follow me, I'm, I'm, just go to LinkedIn, LinkedIn and look me up. I'm Robert Quinn, uh, a semiconductor industry content provider and uh, pretty easy to find. I have posted over... Uh, posted hundreds of posts. I post about four times a day and um, on, on the semiconductor industry. And I've had about 1.5 million views of my content uh, just this year to date. So it's a lot of, lot of viewership and getting a lot of attention. Um, but uh, things that are interesting to me right now, mostly in the market, is the growth of, uh, of these new fabs in the United States. There's still a lot of toss up of where Samsung is going to go. Um, is it going to be in Arizona? Is it going to be in New York? Is it going to be in Austin, Texas? Um, uh, the little birdies that talk, you know, you, you hear, the, hear the rumors. Um, and I, the rumors I hear are in Austin. They say that it's going to happen in Austin. Um, That's but, more traffic for you right down the road there. They are just rumors right now, but uh, Samsung still hasn't committed to uh, making that, uh, you know, making that a public announcement that they're going to build and where, where they're going to build. Um, I believe that they're still trying to, uh, there's, Austin has has pushed back on their um, their proposal. They, they proposed getting uh, some on mil millions of dollars uh, in incentives and city and city and state of Austin have pushed back on that. And so I believe that there's a kind of a, 
a, a rumble there between the two of them. And hopefully, uh, hopefully they come to their senses and because it would be such a good thing for Austin, Austin, Texas to uh, get that fab. And, uh, and, and I think that would, that would be great. Um, but the, the mark, just keeping up with the market and seeing who's, who's expanding and who's, um, who's going to build these fabs. I mean, these fabs are, are, you know, Samsung is talking about spending $17 billion. Intel is talking about spending $200 billion. Intel's starting off with $35 billion, going up to $100 billion. Um, not, not Intel, I'm sorry, TSMC. Um, and the seeing the growth of the markets and seeing how much they're expanding uh, tells us a lot what the, about what the chip production need is going to be in the future. And uh, uh, Putin, uh, president of the president of Russia, put it in, the, in an interesting term. He said, "The leader of the uh, le the leader of technology will be the leader of the world in the future." Hmm. And uh, I think that United States definitely sees that as as a need to be the leader of technology of the world. And so we're investing a lot. We've got a lot of. Uh, government backing coming uh, to these fabs and to uh, all this chip production. And so we'll, uh, we'll definitely see where it takes us in the future, though. It is definitely a trend that we need to have on our investing radar. When you see tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars that we know are tied directly to customer demand, uh, definitely something that we should be watching. Uh, Robert, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me on the 7 Investing Podcast today. No problem. It was great. Great being with you. Thanks. And once again, follow Robert Quinn on LinkedIn, and we really appreciate you tuning into this episode of our 7 Investing Podcast. We're here to empower you to invest in your future. We are 7 Investing.